Great. Well, it's nice to see uh, many people from around uh, Villanova, around the US, uh, from the UK as well. I see we have uh, folks in the audience from all sorts of different uh, backgrounds uh, joining us today. I'm uh, Vincent Lloyd. I direct the Africana Studies program here at Villanova University. Uh, I also teach in the Theology and Religious Studies program. And we're uh, very excited to be uh, offering uh, this event uh, on a topic that's uh, much in the news uh, of recent days of interest uh, in politics, in the academy, in law, uh, and uh, as we're thinking about uh, the resources that uh, critical race theory might have for uh, thinking about questions of race, thinking of questions of, of justice, um, uh, and why it's uh, prompted uh, such uh, lively uh, conversations of late. Uh, and uh, we're pleased to have uh, three distinguished colleagues with us. I will uh, just introduce our moderator. Uh, but before that, I should say, if you're interested in uh, learning more about uh, the activities of Africana Studies at Villanova, you can always follow us on social media at Nova Africana. If you'd like to be added to our emailing list, you can also email me, vincent.lloyd at villanova.edu, and I'll put that in the chat. Uh, as well. Uh, so today we have with us uh, as our moderator and facilitator, uh, Professor Ebony Coletu. Uh, uh, Dr. Coletu is Assistant Professor of African American Studies, English, and African uh, Studies. Right? Yep, that's it. Um, and African Studies at Penn State University. Her book project, Forms of Submission, Writing for Aid and Opportunity in America, explores the role of biographic details in the distribution of resources, connecting contemporary debates about applications, identity, and value to writing practices rooted in slavery. Before coming to Penn State, she taught in the rhetoric department at the American University in Cairo, and she has published on race and revolution in Egypt and diasporic return to Africa. With that, I'll turn it over to Ebony. Thanks so much, Vincent. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be in conversation. So um, I just want to reiterate, if anybody who came late wants to go ahead and mute themselves, that will uh, mean that you can choose when to enter the conversation uh, a little bit later during the Q&A. And with that said, um, there is a chat, I think. Um, Vincent, we don't have a separate Q&A, right? Okay, good. So when you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. And when we open it up, I'll be able to scan and pull your questions. And I'll also introduce some questions too. So the structure I think for today is that um, our two speakers will talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we will open it up. I'll kick off the questions and then you can jump in as well. Um, I'll go ahead and give a short introduction to each of them. Um, Glenn Bracey is going to kick us off. Um, so I'll start with his biography. So um, Glenn is an assistant professor of sociology at Villanova, um, where his scholarship focuses on race, social movements, and religion. He has won multiple awards for teaching and scholarship, including the 2016 Oliver Cromwell Cox Award from the American Sociological Association. That's from the section on racial and ethnic minorities um, for his article toward a critical race theory of state, which is an incredible article. If you haven't read it, definitely this is an opportunity to download. So he is a published in leading sociology journals and he's an emerging expert on sports and social movements. Currently, Bracey is co-principal investigator with Michael Emerson on race, the race, religion and justice project. Um, our second speaker, Casey Park is an associate professor of law at Georgetown University, and her scholarship examines the history of colonization and slavery and the creation of the American property system. She received a law degree from Harvard and her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. And before coming to Georgetown, she was the critical race studies fellow at the UCLA School of Law and an equal justice works fellow and staff attorney in El Paso, where she investigated predatory mortgage and lending schemes. And her articles have appeared in publications, including the University of Chicago Law Review, Harvard Law Review, The History of the Present, Law and Social Inquiry, as well as a notable op-ed in New York Times that I hope we can revisit today, given its uh, very recent renewed relevance. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Glenn, uh, if you want to kick us off, and then we can transition to Casey whenever you're ready to jump in. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you, uh, Vincent, for the uh, <clears throat> invitation, and thank you for everybody. Thank you to everybody who has decided to join us today. I greatly appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the conversation and hearing what everybody has to say. I want to start by answering the question directly, what is critical race theory? And uh, because not everybody knows, and there's a lot of debate about what it is. So I'll say critical race theory is a a uh, movement that started from leftist in law schools in the late 20th century, let's call it the, the late 1970s, uh, early 1980s, and has grown since then to reach into lots of academic uh, areas. It's fundamentally a critique of how race shapes and is shaped by the law, how race shapes the law in terms of uh, legal jurisprudence, uh, legislation, uh, law school pedagogy and enforcement, of the law, it's a, it's a look at how law racializes every aspect of our lives from constructing racial categories themselves and defining what each racial category means, what rights and privileges attach to it. Um, motivating, it motivates racialized performances at work. It limits our practicable rights in terms of reproduction and immigration and education. Uh, in, in activism, which is a very big deal today. We've seen, obviously, from January 6th, the way that uh, different activism is treated differently depending on who the racialized actors are. And critical race theory has six basic tenets. One is that race is socially constructed. Uh, race is not natural. It's not biological. It is a social construction, uh, but it is real. It, it is not real objectively, but it is real in its social effects because people uh, put weight on it. Second tenet is that racism is a normal outcome of U.S. institutions and social relations. Race is not, racism is not something that you experience when somebody uh, uses a racial slur. It's not just something that you experience when someone uses a racial slur or you encounter someone who is prejudiced. Uh, racism is the everyday operation of our American systems. So the fact that I, I live in West Philadelphia, the fact that I wake up every morning in a black neighborhood is because of the history of uh, institutional racism. Intersectionality is the third tenet. It's the notion that our identities uh, put us into different social locations. Those social locations come with specific needs and perspectives and insights on the world, and that we can gain a lot about the notion of truth or the notion of uh, how our entire society operates by paying attention to the people who speak from those different locations. The fourth, of course, is uh, the black-white binaries, the notion that our society was uh, largely organized along a uh, white on top, black on bottom uh, binary, but that racism affects different racial groups differently. So Native Americans are affected by race and racism differently than, say, uh, African Americans at some levels. The fifth, and I would say most, uh, most controversial, is the notion that racism is permanent, that the racial poles of white on black uh, are, um, are permanent, and they're not permanent because of objective reasoning. They're not permanent because whites are superior to blacks or uh, because blacks occupy some uh, uh, distinct role at the bottom. It's because whites are fixated on blackness and anti-blackness, and, uh, and they orient different other racial groups uh, in the middle of white and black in order to, pr to protect their own superiority. In other words, racism is something that white people could decide to give up. They could change the social institutions, they could change the way that they, uh, their anti-blackness, but they won't. So critical race theory recognizes choice, but also recognizes a bit of uh, permanence in that choice. And the last is a commitment to narrative, that uh, the law normally excises uh, things that it sees as extraneous, but those extraneous things are the things that animate our racialized world. And without them, without seeing how race contextualizes everything in, in, our, in our lives, uh, we end up with fundamental injustices. So that's, um, that's my answer to what critical race theory is. I want to say we are here today in large part because uh, of how it, as, as Dr. Lloyd said, how it's been in, how critical race theory has been in the news of late. And one of the big news items, of course, was President Trump uh, 
banning uh, critical race theory in government uh, operations and, and uh, government teaching. And I want to say for without, well, being blunt, uh, President Trump is not known as someone who would dig through the academy to find the cutting edge thought and uh, <laughs> leading theories. So we know that he got this from somewhere. And I would tell you that he got it from the church. Uh, he got it from white evangelicalism in particular has been very upset about critical race theory. To give you some examples, in 2019, the, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest white evangelical denomination in the country, released a statement uh, on critical race theory and intersectionality it details the, ba the Southern Baptist Convention's, quote, concerns that critical race theory has, quote, been appropriated by individuals with worldviews that are contrary to the Christian faith, resulting in ideologies and methods that contradict scripture. Uh, a second example is from 2018, uh, the statement on social justice and the gospel authored by John MacArthur, who you may or may not know, but his, uh, his podcast, Grace to You, has been promoting his sermons in over 23 countries around the world. So in evangelical circles, he's huge. And this, uh, this uh, statement has, over, has almost 16,000 uh, signatures on it. It says, quote, we deny that Christian belief, character, or conduct can be detailed by, can be dictated, excuse me, by any authority other than, other than scripture, and we deny that, that the postmodern ideologies derived from intersectionality, radical feminism, and critical race theory are consistent with biblical teaching. I could go on with uh, evangelical attacks on critical race theory, but there are years of them, uh, and they all boil down to a notion that critical race theory challenges uh, the notion of an objective truth, uh, that intersectionality privileges some voices over others, in particular privileges racialized minorities' voices over the uh, voices of whites, and that it is, like, like I say, contrary to scripture uh, in the sense of, of objectivity. So I think that it's important for us to, given the power, frankly, of the church uh, to move politics, given its funding, given uh, how so many people come to the academy uh, first with the church as a, as a large backdrop in their lives, that it's important that we as critical race theorists be able to speak to them on their terms. So I would say that we as critical race theorists should continue to be aggressive in promoting critical race theory, that we should uh, say how it relates to spirituality and religion in particular. So I'll do that in, um, in just a couple of, of ways. We lost you. Do you hear me now? Yes, you're back. Okay, I'm back. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, one is to say that evangelical Christians are very upset about critical race theory because it is self-consciously grounded in Marxism. Now, when evangelical Christians here is grounded in Marxism, what they think is religion is opiate of the masses, right? That religion is a distraction from justice, that religion is nothing more than uh, fictions that, are, are, uh, that make people deviate from reality. And of course, evangelicals hold that religion is the ultimate reality. But I want to say that the Marxist foundation of critical race theory is at base a spiritual concern. If you read Marx, you know that he was concerned about alienation, specifically alienation of the species being, that element of humanity uh, that provides creativity, that is unique to the individual, uh, that really gives us, it, it is what defines humans from animals in that case, and that Marx was concerned that our modern systems were flattening that humanity and, and alienating us from the creative endeavors that, that we were, uh, well, Christians would say, we were designed to uh, emulate and to, and to practice. So the core question for critical race theory is one of releasing people, especially people of color, especially Black people, from 
uh, the oppressive systems that deny us access to our species being, including racism. It's Marxism, my point being critical race theories, Marxism is, function, is fundamentally a spiritual uh, concern and it's the same spiritual concern that evangelical Christians have and that they believe that uh, all people are made in the imago dei, the, the uh, image of God. And they are endowed by their creator <laughs> with uh, special abilities, creativity, individuality that needs to be manifested in the world. So the, the church and critical race theory actually have the same, uh, the same purpose when, with respect to uh, the Marxist origins, even though evangelicals don't seem to recognize that. The second point that I would make is that evangelicals concern about uh, truth and concern about uh, intersectionality in particular and their concern about unity is something that comes out of, I think, a misreading of critical race theory and, and perhaps a misreading of uh, their own sacred text. Uh, I'll give you an example. So intersectionality is an argument that uh, we need to, that we've historically privileged the voices of the dominant group that we need to privilege the voices of the subordinate group in order to get a better and more holistic view of what the truth is. That parallels a scripture, and forgive me for reading uh, from the New Testament. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 23 through 25. It says that Christians are all part of one body, quote, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And on and our unpresentable parts have greater uh, have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. In other words, God recognized in order to create a unified body in the church, God recognized that he was bringing together people from different social locations and that those different social locations had different levels of honor and dishonor and that the way to bring about security, the, uh, to bring about unity, to bring about equality, to restore the equality that is implied by the Imago Dei was to give more honor to those parts that society had denied uh, honor to. In other words, the marginalized voices are supposed to be privileged in the church, which is the same argument that intersectionality and critical race theory make about voices in all of our social institutions. So again, I, I, I do not think that, you know, crit critical race theory does not start out as primarily a, uh, uh, a religious uh, endeavor. It starts out as a legal endeavor and its uh, insights are mostly in the law. But because the church has gathered itself as the chief opposition, I think the critical race theorists should be able and, and are able to answer the church on its own terms and fend off this particular uh, attack through the language of critical race theory and the language of the church at the same time. And with that, I'll end my discussion. Wonderful, thank you so much. Casey, would you like to take over? Sure, yes, thank you, Glenn. Can everybody hear me, first of all? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for that, Glenn. It was very illuminating. Um, as a lawyer and someone who teaches at a law school, I have not thought so much about the dimensions of this problem having to do with the church. And so thank you, that was incredibly rich and helpful. Um, I, We'll just go over the key questions we received also, you know, the topics that um, are on the table for today. So what is critical race theory? I mean, I think um, Professor Bracey has done an incredibly thorough job. So I'll just add, I think, you know, as a, as a school that originated within law schools, um, the way I think about it is that it is both a very small group of academics, actually, at least within law schools, and yet it also casts an incredibly large tent. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is for better or worse, there is a much broader popular understanding of critical race theory now, um, in part um, made even broader by the attacks from the last administration, which um, 
had no idea what it was talking about, of course, but was also onto something, I think, in the sense that the School of Critical Race Theory, which is frankly pretty marginalized within law schools, has undergone pretty sustained attack within law schools um, for a very long time. And also, I would say, is by no means uniformly Marxist. Maybe we can talk about that later in the discussion. And that's maybe an interesting uh, disciplinary difference. Even though it is a small, rather marginalized group of academics within law schools, it has had a huge impact on the way that people think about race and institutions more broadly on race and the law, um, on other fields of scholarly inquiry, um, sociology, religious studies, among others, but also on practice. And this takes us back to the kind of locus of the law school and what we do. Um, this is evident in the kind of diversity trainings on implicit bias um, that the administration was protesting and, and outlawing, but also in how courts and practitioners, advocates think about context and history um, and where and how these questions of race are arising in the phenomena that they see as they seek to govern. Um, so, why does that matter today? I think I think everyone who's here this afternoon for this session is already on board with the fact that it matters. Um, race is something that everyone's got an opinion on, but there's obviously a lot to think about and learn. And I would say that's especially true that we can learn a lot from scholarship, specifically with respect to the question of institutions um, and law, the history of institutions and law. Um, race is an enormously complex issue in terms of how it works through those institutions. And it is not very well understood because that study has been marginalized for most of the existence of these institutions, <laughs> educational institutions included. And consequently, there are very well-established stories about governance, about Congress, elected officials, fields like property contracts and so on and so forth go all the way down the line, anything you can think of, evidence, civil procedure. Um, there are very well-established stories about American history and law um, that everyone is familiar with that are built on a complete erasure of the issue of race and the histories of conquest and slavery, which is what I study. Um, so again, this is not just a scholarly inquiry. This does mean that the stories are wrong, um, but it's not just a matter of more accurate facts. Obviously, it's also a practical question of how we design our institutions, think about our institutions, practice within those institutions, and also one about popular consciousness and a sense of um, what this nation is. Um, and that conversation is servicing all over the place. And um, I sort of view it as my, there's a question here about how does this have to do with your own work? I view it as my um, interest and role to help bring the legal academy, which affects legal practice and legal institutions more into line, because it is just shockingly behind. It is just shockingly behind and operating on narratives um, from which the stories of people of color, of Native people, of Black people, of many immigrant groups in America have been so systematically filtered out um, that the challenge of recovering those histories is very, very high. Um, people are not asking what difference they make and they make a huge difference, I would say, to the way we understand the costs of these institutions, the dynamics um, and how we might fix them in the future. So um, I work on this um, in a lot of different ways, but specifically right now I'm teaching property. So I'm focused on the question of property. I've studied the history of the creation of the property system a lot. And I'm happy to get into more specifics, maybe in Q&A. Um, I don't wanna bore you with all of the details, but um, you know, just to be concrete about it, one part of the work that I'm doing entails going back over 130 years of modern legal education and text to show how the understandings people have have come about, basically to show people there's no good reason for what you do. There's no good reason. There are racist reasons. You know, there are all of these correlations with, um, you know, the history of Jim Crow and conquest um, that explain why these histories were dropped, omitted, erased. You don't have a good excuse for not recognizing these things as foundational to the system. And it takes all of this labor, frankly, to pull up all of that in order to make a case to be listened to at all. And that has to do with an extreme siloing of um, disciplinary siloing that is present in law schools, but definitely also elsewhere, where race studies is sort of marginalized in its own 
you know, minority school of thought that doesn't have to do with the center um, of the field of property or the center of the field of contracts or the center of the field of constitutional law, which of course is where it belongs. So this I think is, is sort of the moment that we're at. I think the insurrection at the Capitol happened just down the street here, um, you know, in January has made, and then all of the protests last summer as well, really was a sort of wake up call to a lot of institutions. Um, you know, I think we can actually thank the last administration for this, for waging such a public and explicit and loud war um, that it made institutions it's so ironic. I really can't tell you law schools have just marginalized critical race studies for so long that they were sort of all like, this is news to us. This is important. Anyone cares about this? Anyway, um, it is sort of a favor um, that I think we have to acknowledge that they did us of centering this question and saying, um, this is what we view as a threat because it is a threat. It is what has been changing society and changing people's sensibilities. The students certainly know it. The students are hungry for this, um, but there is considerable resistance within these institutions and a lot to work through, you know, um, understandably also <laughs> to be told that all of your established understandings, received understandings of your field and your knowledge and your expertise um, are built on erasures is... Um, is kind of hard to swallow. So I think that's the moment we're in, is trying to confront these questions and try to do it all at once, understand how it is that we got here, and also try to take stock of all the things that have been left out of the analysis for so long to get a clear sense um, of how to move forward, of what the problems actually are in the present. Lest we fall back on some other received understandings that we haven't properly understood, that we think are liberatory, um, but are actually parts of liberal to fascist propaganda that have arisen from previous understandings, um, not based on material um, understandings of what has actually happened in the history of this country. Um, maybe I'll leave it there because I know we're halfway through our time and I want to hear from everybody here. Does that work? Sure. For you know, I have so many questions that all my uh, task is here is just to arrange them in a way that we can have a conversation. So I'm going to invite participants, also people who are tuning in, to just put your questions in the chat. Um, I will feel free to kick us off. And, and I have a couple of questions. Perhaps I'll, I'll frame it generally, and then I'll ask you specifically related to your work, because I think I like what you said, Casey, about this, um, thinking of it as a kind of practice theory, um, as something that uh, critical race theory really takes place at this kind of nexus between something that you're trying to do within institutions, a kind of transformational process that's very slow and that's characterized by a lot of reversals, um, a lot of seeming gains that then get undone, right? So I think of critical race theory as a powerful explanation for a lot of these um, super, what seem like superficial gains in the rear view mirror. Um, and then you wonder, what can you do differently? Um, so I want to ask both of you a question about what it is that um, critical race theory offers you in terms of a retort or um, a response to this kind of frustrating, almost cynical sense um, that it's more of the same. And I'm going to ask the question in two different ways. For Queso, I'm going to ask you because you do a lot of historical work. And I think sometimes the inclination people have um, is to hear historical work as saying, yeah, nothing's changed. We've been doing this from the beginning. Um, this is uh, an, end going, an ongoing repetition of policies. And um, I think of your self-deportation article in particular as something that says, you know, um, I'm trying to correct your false sense that this is new, right? This is in fact an old set of practices but you're doing something else too. You're not just leaving us feeling um, the heaviness or the weight of the unending same. You're arguing perhaps that we should have different targets for intervention that are opened up by a longer historical view and a different idea of how our institutions operate. So I wanna hear a little bit more from, from you perhaps, and I'll give you a minute as I phrase uh, Glenn's question to formulate what you wanna say, but I was thinking of that article in particular as something that says, hey, obviously people, Trump did not invent self-deportation, um, Obama did not invent self-deportation, but 
what does this offer us in the present nonetheless to have this kind of analysis that you're offering? Mm, thank you so much for that, Ebony. Um, that's so generous. And I really appreciate that, um, that recognition that there are at the same time really um, longstanding patterns that I do aim to point out um, as well as to show the dynamism of institutions of law and also racialization, the processes of racialization and how those two things are imbricated and shape one another. Um, these things change over time and they change for specific reasons towards specific ends. And there is always a contest, right? So there are always people fighting. And the sort of insight I wanna offer is a little different based on what it is I'm specifically talking about. So in the self-deportation example, you know that paper was in part aimed at this field of immigration law, which is you know no disparagement to them whatsoever. They are um, frontline triaging constantly, but very much focused constantly on this question of deportation, deportation and questions of entry and exit. Um, Sorry, I think someone unmuted and that was an echo. I think you have a little bit of an echo, but if you can tolerate it, then- No, let's... it's off. I've seen it. Okay, great. Yeah, great. Um, so, so what was I saying? Um, to shift the focus into a larger, into the larger back, since not everyone will have read that article. So I'll just say what I tried to do in that article was to show that along with this, um, sort of more spectacular use of force by government paid agents to remove people from the country. Um, there has been a parallel conversation that goes back to the beginning of settlement um, where people have contemplated the same question, how do we get rid of this unwanted group and explicitly considered alongside their physical removal by force acknowledging that's a very expensive, bureaucratic, <laughs> massive endeavor, that it might be easier to pass laws that would make pe this group so uncomfortable that they would leave of their own accord. And this was true when people talked about native removal for centuries. It was talked about in the antebellum period um, with regard to the slavery problem. They were like, well, if we actually want abolition, but then we'll have this unwanted group here. So what can we do? We'll have to pass similar laws. They drew explicitly on the history of native removal in order to get ideas and also develop colonization plans for that kind of forced deportation in that time too. So when the country has thought about how do we keep this nation racially homogenous and pure, they have considered a couple of different tactics, those two, deportation and self-deportation at every turn. And I wanted to show how this 400 year history actually shaped the landscape, the social landscape of the nation really to impose forms of subordination made um, by laws that are in the background that make these groups uncomfortable um, so that they will either leave or so that if they stay, that presence is conditional upon them accepting certain things like really low wage labor, no protections by law for basic rights that citizens are entitled to, that sort of thing. And that this has a very long history. And that if we only think of this as a matter of citizenship and borders and entry and exit, we are missing the larger issues that have always been at stake in questions of government regulation of migration, um, which has always been racialized and concerned also with techniques of subordination. So that was what I wanted to say there. Um, it's different, I would say, for different subjects. So I also work on the field of property and um, I know what you mean. I never expected to be working early in the 17th century. I wasn't trained in this. I mean, I've sort of trained myself over a decade, but the reason I do that is not just to say um, these things are forever old, <laughs> you know, and permanent and with us, it's actually quite the contrary. So the reason I do that is because we take so much about this land system for granted and we think it is natural to buy and sell and trade land like it's chattel, like it's air. Um, now all these speculative interests, but in fact, um, for most of the world's history, that was unthinkable. And in England, where, um, you know, legal scholars and legal institutions claim to take their whole heritage, it was actually, there was no conception of an enclosure of land 
that was this liquid, this tradable, um, certainly no conception of being able to foreclose on people for non-payment of debts, just throw them out, leave them homeless. There was no conception that that was an acceptable thing to have in your whole legal system. And so the reason I go so far back is because that is when those innovations occurred. Those innovations were introduced through the process of colonization and dispossession. Um, a lot of different aspects of property law were, and they actually constitute the very basic elements of the system we have today. Also not really focused on in property law because it's as detached from the real estate market as it is from questions of race. So I'm trying to bring these both together to say the land system that makes real estate liquid, the comprehensive title registry, the system of survey, mortgage foreclosure for non-payment of debts, um, this sense of ownership even as absolute um, power to exclude anyone from this thing that is yours, all of these notions developed in specific ways through the process of colonization, some earlier, some later, and I'm tracking their development through this time in order to point out that, yeah, some of these are pretty old because they worked very well. So they were adopted by the colonies and then the United States and have become a permanent part of our land system that we take for granted. Um, but also as these tools were refined, the ways that um, they were introduced involved a lot of innovation that also drew on the resource of racialization in order to introduce more violent tools that proved so successful that they then became tools of general use. So I'm trying to show what the dynamics are between innovation and between race in order to develop a market because that's how we got this one. So, um, so thank you for that question. I am really concerned with both the persistent patterns we don't see as well as also all of the opportunities um, to challenge and to build and to counter and part of the point, as you have already observed, but I'll just make more explicit, is exactly that. If we don't see self-deportation as part of the immigration problem, and we don't understand how much the government has always enlisted private individuals to do its work for them, then if we just think the problem is one of changing the law and making the state stop doing that, then we miss how complicit we are mm -hmm in what's going on and also every opportunity that we have to help a neighbor, for example, which is sounds trivial, but it's not. It's literally what the entire system depends on. Um, and that is, you know, if we don't see that, then I think that is due to a misunderstanding of our institutions that comes from not studying this history. So I've talked long enough. Um, no, I mean, I really appreciate that. And I just want to underscore, again, one of the real gifts, I think, of a critical race theory approach is being able to put the focus on institutions and not just be so preoccupied with the idea of advocacy for inclusion or for certain groups of people getting certain very limited liberal rights, um, but actually saying that you can look at our institutions to find the limitations, not just the law or the policy. So. I really appreciate you deepening that uh, understanding. Glenn, I wanted to just pose a question to you, which is similarly based on your work. And, and I think um, an important distinction perhaps in this moment, is, especially in the wake of January 6th, is the idea um, of your contribution to critical race theory as a theory of state versus maybe what people would might be tempted to conflate it with, which is a, a racial state theory. Um, I think they sound so similar to most people. It seems like, yeah, basically one is a version of the other. But um, it's, it's in a lot of ways very important for you to argue um, a distinction in order to really surface or make more um, articulate the kinds of dynamics that are rendered invisible um, by converging, let's say, state interests with the interests of a particular group of unnamed people, right? Um, so I wonder if you could just say more because there's some real benefit there maybe in adding some texture to this conversation about what CRT offers. Wow, that's a big and complicated question. <laughs> oh, you can feel free to kind of narrow it down even to an example. And I think the reason why I offered Jan 6 is because there's this, again, kind of spectacle that we have of a certain kind of group that gets to storm the cap storm the capital and gets to be called patriots. And that kind of conflates their interests with the state in a certain way. And you say something quite specific. You're like, the state is not an actor, it's a tool. And mm -hmm. so I, I would love for you to kind of say what that distinction offers us, because I think it's quite a powerful one. Sure. So let's let's start with the notion of the racial state, which is uh, Omi Amanat's um, 
a formulation of the state that's, I, I would argue, based in uh, pluralism and uh, a semi-autonomous view of the state <clears throat> uh, in which the state has, it, the, they claim that the state has interests of, it, of its own apart from, uh, apart from society. But then when you read closely, you realize that the state, the, the interests that it presumes are the state's interests are actually the, the interest of whites. And uh, they have uh, anthropomorphized, I guess, um, the, the state as uh, an entity when in fact, as I think Gooden says, you know, institutions don't have wills. Uh, they don't have interest on their own. It's people who have those wills and have those interests. And so we have to learn to think of the state not as its own, uh, as its own feature, but rather as a tool uh, that is in the hands, and in our case, because the state has been designed in, in many of the ways Dr. Clark talked about, uh, has been designed around uh, white supremacy, has been designed around facilitating white dominance of uh, all other racial groups. It is a tool that is not available to everybody. It is suited specifically to white interests it is available specifically for whites to manipulate. And we saw the difference this summer and then again on January 6th, where when people of color made, uh, made uh, demands on the state, the state was unwilling to hear them and responded with violence because the state is designed to, to quash basically people of color and, and to prevent equality. It is not a pluralistic state that's open to the demands of everybody. On the other hand, when white people made outrageous demands on the state, uh, even uh, denying the, the, you know, our constitutional processes, um, the, they found that the state was open to them. That, you know, the Republican party, which uh, was in power in the Senate, at least at the time, uh, the majority of, of the, the House members and, and the Senate uh, went along with the demands of this radical white group that was overtly white supremacist. So that positions us. What, is that, what does that purchase us? So what that gets us is, A, first and foremost for me, it gets us out of blaming people of color for being uh, insufficiently skilled or, um, or undisciplined in our attempts to address the state. Um, if you take the pluralistic view, uh, if you take the racial state view, then the problem fundamentally is why haven't people of color done whatever they needed to do to possess, to, to use the state as a tool in, in their interest over and against whites. And that is the wrong so, so it leads to a at least to a blaming of people of color that I think is unnecessary and very unhelpful. I think it also positions us to think of means of redress that are uh, to be less state focused, I should say, in our attempts to to do redress. So, race is carried out in all of our social institutions. It's carried out in all the aspects of our lives. And uh, too much, I would say, of our social movement activism, too much of our, uh, too many of our discussions around uh, how to pursue liberation are built around uh, an assumption that the state is available for our use. We have to put that aside and think of other ways uh, to pursue our interests. So I'll, I'll stop there. I muted myself. I was so excited because I'm going to come back to that point. I think when you say that um, to put the state aside, it's such an interesting argument from sociology. Um, but I also think uh, I'm going to in integrate a little bit and maybe hybridize. I hope, Aaron, this is OK. There's a question in the chat. Um, I'm going to merge perhaps your question, uh, Aaron, with, with a pre-existing question. Um, and this really is about um, 
critical race theory in a global frame. Um, because I, I think in some ways, the argument often goes um, quite uh, interestingly following Trump, right? The argument goes that critical race theory kind of pollutes the discourse and it makes us think that somehow um, this American export of a racial theory is applicable in other places where in fact it obscures local histories and dynamics that have nothing to do with race. Um, and so this is um, sort of a pushback argument. Um, but we also know that plenty of scholars in law and education and sociology, et cetera, in economics even have, have really considered critical race theory an important global conversation. So I wonder, um, taking up Aaron's question about how we understand critical race theory in a global frame, um, as it's expanded into more and more disciplines, have you seen different opportunities for conversation, for collaboration um, that have really been gained traction in ways that are meaningful? Um, and then the second part of that question that Aaron points out, of course, this has been recently in the news from French academics, um, he says, after a teacher was beheaded, saying that these conversations, quote, needed to fight intellectual currents coming from US universities that view society through the lens of ethnic origin, religion, or gender, rather than the French Republican ideal of equality, because they risk the fragmentation of society and created a vision of the world, which converges with the, in the, uh, with the interests of Islamists. So of course, this is, you can answer in any way you would like, but of course this French kind of disposition toward racializing Islam uh, is also true in the US. And so we can think of racial formations also including religious identities uh, as well. Um, so if you wanna think maybe about CRT in a global frame and what conversations that enables, and then maybe kind of as, a, as an um, a addendum to that, maybe this French retort, uh, you have something to say to that as well. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I wasn't sure in case it looked like you were reaching for the mic. I thought you were on the cusp, so I'm gonna nominate you, Casey. Happy, go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy to say a few things about that. Um, so CRT in a global frame. Well, I think it's important to um, distinguish a few different kinds of questions we could ask about the global frame. There is um, an analog to CRT that examines questions of international law. It's called Third World Approaches to International Law, or TOIL, um, that I think similarly tries to question these sort of um, universally framed um, abstract um, explanations of international law as upholding justice and so on and so forth by kind of excavating the colonial history that underlies them and showing um, how international law itself has developed. Of course, that's different from um, the sort of more comparative project of how different countries um, are um, exploring their own pasts of colonization and enslavement, which many are. I'm not a comparativist, but I know that many, many are, you know, and so that is an ongoing endeavor that I think um, this quote, this idea that this is all coming from the US is just like very infantilizing to French academics who have their own history of resistance and inquiry. And that's true everywhere, right? This kind of um, looking back to the past to better understand the present and think to the future um, and movements for justice, frankly, are happening everywhere. Um, but it also seems like it's something that governments like to do is blame it on outside sources or influence. Um, I think that the question of what is happening domestically in different places around the world is complicated by the fact that the US has explicitly been exporting many of its systems. And so to the extent that there is US influence, I would think it, I mean, maybe, we're influencing, I think there's an ongoing conversation where the influence is mutual at a scholarly level, but at an institutional level, certainly the US government has been very, very active in exporting its systems of criminal law and punishment, um, its property systems, its models of the constitution, all kinds of things around the globe. And so to that extent, I would say there is a real need to consider US influence and the ambition to create um, a market, a global market more accessible to US interests um, and other interests. Um, so there's many different dimensions of this global question, you know, the sort of overarching um, structure of international governance, different domestic countries, um, own histories and issues, but also the extent to which countries have influenced 
each other, um, especially the United States, which in the last centuries had such a concerted program of trying to um, get other countries to pick up its models of, of law and institutional organization. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I think, of course, really foregrounding imperialism as, as the kind of pre-existing infrastructure, you know, that you don't have to kind of invent a whole theory to supposedly kind of force connections when the connections are already quite evident to many people, perhaps most people around the world. So, um, Glenn, do you have anything to add to this? The only thing I would add is to say that critical race theory is, has always been about the silences that exist in the institutions. So uh, to hear the French um, and there are lots of people who would go along with uh, that perspective, um, you know, argue that this is a, a external thing, um, that, that they have a sameness of their culture, that it's unnecessary to race it, even as they're racializing uh, Muslims, et cetera. That has always been the work of critical race theory to talk about how those things that are unmentioned are actually raced. Uh, and in that way, it's critical race theory is transposable to issues around the world. Great. And, and I see we have another question in the chat from Natalia. Again, um, forgive me because I'm just going to keep merging them with uh, a ton of questions I have too. Um, but Natalia, you know, you rightfully and I think anticipated one of my questions about some of the tools uh, or approaches that you find useful in CRT. And one of the things that came to mind, especially Glenn, as you were talking is, um, you know, about these tenets or features, but I think could we kind of push more toward what analytic tools have been uh, useful and maybe one or two that, that you find helpful? Um, two things that, that came to mind that I want to ask about in particular is uh, about the concept of interest convergence. To what degree does that still resonate for you? And to what degree do you feel scholarship is moving beyond that model? Um, uh, you know, we have these kind of early cohorts of critical race theorists who really developed so many tremendous tools, which of those do you still really keep coming back to? Um, and what do you think is maybe a new generation of scholarship in CRT that you find useful? I, I hear you, Kesu, talking a lot in the tradition of, I think, a next another generation, which does a lot more kind of histor deep historical cross-institutional work um, as opposed to kind of unpacking some of the um, betrayals uh, of, of certain forms of advocacy. So um, if either of you want to speak to that, I think maybe that kind of folds in Natalia's question. Do you want to go first, Glenn, or do you want me to? Uh, I'm happy to follow you, uh, Kesu, but if you want me to go first, I'll go first. Um, I'm happy to go first. So, um, you know, I don't know if I would call them subfields, um, but related, there are certainly, there's certainly a lot of fields that are related to CRT, that CRT has was even in its um, first articulations highly influenced by um, that are surfacing now, not only as a result of CRT, but because of what is happening in the world and frankly, the development of the movements from which CRT drew on in the first place. So, um, you know, there's a pretty also long tradition within law schools of thinking about social movements and, and the law that CRT um, theorists were in close conversation with them. There's a lot of overlap and that seems to be more important than ever. And there's people picking up this question of what movement law really means. Um, maybe more directly, I think this is carried by movements themselves, but also CRT theorists have always, um, I think, um, you know, thought very, you know, a lot about abolitionist frameworks in the Black radical tradition. So that's another one that kind of goes outside of the legal academy, but also is represented within it through CRT. Um, and then finally, I think um, another sort of field of scholarship that is growing, but has its roots in both of the things that I, I just mentioned, um, you know, literature on social movements and abolitionist movements, which are really the same thing, um, racial capitalism as like a new framework that is growing in academia that I also work under, which is sort of like CRT in the sense that it is, 
um, looking to silences. We wouldn't really have a need to call it that if analyses of capitalism hadn't so, um, you know, obstinately excluded race from their analysis for so long. And also, um, there is a way that the way that um, scholarship on race has grown has also not excluded, but sort of marginalized questions of capitalism. And so to find that ground, um, there is scholarship that represents um, that crossover from a very long time ago. And that's where we find our genealogy, but it's growing now. And I think all of these schools are in conversation with each other. So if you're looking for related work, um, those might be good places to start. Wonderful. And because we only have about five minutes left, I just want to invite Glenn to chime in here and then um, maybe we can just do last words. So go ahead, Glenn. Okay. So I, I will say that I think that the tools that critical race theory has, I, I'll respond to the tools that, that critical race theory already has developed. And then one thing that I think is, is promising, but is not from critical race theory. And that is, you mentioned interest convergence theory. I think that interest convergence theory is still extraordinarily useful. I think it's very useful, uh, especially for social movements analysis. Um, and I, I could talk more about that, but I would say coming from an intersection, uh, from an interest convergence perspective, what is scary is seeing the things that Derek Bell talked about before uh, when he laid out the idea of interest, of, of interest, of interest convergence. Um, that there is a, a fight between powerful, large and powerful segments of the white population uh, that is functionally making our government uh, unusable, um, that there are big questions like climate change, uh, what to do about this pandemic, et cetera, that these two large white groups are not agreeing on. And traditionally, the way that they've settled those things is by uh, selling out the rights and interests of people of color. And so when I think about something like, I'll use climate change as an example. Uh, when I think about something like climate change where I see whites at loggerheads over uh, a big social issue, what I began to do is look for how they might find some racial interest to sell out in order to advance uh, their collective white interests. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that that's, it's still useful. I think that we need to recover intersectionality that has become uh, uh, an, a concept divorced from um, divorced from social structure too often. And uh, if we bring it back to uh, how it's, how structure creates those intersections of identity and the specific needs that are necessary, then we could have more purchase um, from that concept. I'll end by saying that militant ignorance is uh, something that I think we should pay more attention to that whites uh, um, refusal to know and fighting back against knowledge uh, is something I think that animates even this conversation, right? The, the uh, hate against uh, critical race theory is militant ignorance. It's not uh, passive ignorance. So those are social forces and, and concepts in CRT that I think are, are relevant. I think uh, that's a wonderful way to kind of draw us to a close. There's something that, you know, you point out even in the example of uh, climate justice, right? Um, which I think Casey would probably say is also really founded upon resource exploitation that's heavily racialized. Um, so of course, these are organic connections that have become commonplace. So if there's um, any sort of, um, if we can end on this kind of what seemed like an almost stupid memo back in September of blaming CRT for um, you, you know somehow destroying America, then we can say that there's a kind of attempt to block the ability to describe and explain the connections um, that would make people more interested in our shared uh, life on the planet. So um, thank you all so much for sharing your work, for being in conversation, and thank you to people who posed questions. I know it's not always easy in a venue like Zoom uh, to do that, so I appreciate your contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, moderating. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much.